Hello and welcome to Bondcast, a podcast series where we discuss our views on the latest themes and events shaping rates markets. I'm Imogen Backer, rate strategist, and I'm joined today by our global market specialists, Giles Gale and Jan Nevrizi. So Giles, a little bit more risk on this week, or should we say a bit more stable risk rather after uh, what we saw last week. How do you feel about that? Well, okay, so I mean, it's been it's been a difficult, I mean, clearly a very difficult time for for risk markets overall, which have really been in the driving seat for for rates globally. Um, no, I, I guess rates have been falling in line with um, with with Jan's view, and he'll come on to that um, in, in 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 a few minutes. European rates have been participating in that. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit strange, really. I mean, anyway, but again, in line with our thinking, um, you know, background thinking about markets. Anyway, it's not like uh, you know we had strongly factored in this level of um, of, of risk volatility. Um, nonetheless, we kind of started the week with. Um, you know, this shift still ringing in our ears from the the, the, the central bank doves having sort of capitulated and said, okay, well, we have a clear path now right through to uh, a zero policy rate. So negative rates will be a thing of the, of the past by uh, by September, unless you know, something hugely dramatic happens to completely derail um, all the economic provisions um, projections, sorry, so so far, um, but no market uh, European rates markets really just took that with a shrug of the shoulders. Um, it was all priced in anyway. In fact, more than that was priced in. So it was just like, yeah, we're already there. You're just catching up, fine. Um, so we've had a little bit of a cur- curve steepening, which is unusual. Um, you know, and it's you know it's, it's it's unusual in the in the recent in, in the recent context by you know for, for sure uh where you know everything has really been driven by front end sort of hawkishness and therefore the expectation that it's all just going to come crashing down and therefore there, you know, th- there's safety in long bonds if you like um now this week what we have we had quite a lot of long term long end supply but i guess you know the, this relief in the front end maybe releases a little bit of uh, of enthusiasm about you know perhaps uh, you know, getting involved in curve steepeners again and i and i think that that it's it's been interesting that that's been sustained through the week. It's you know it's something which is aligned with our view more more generally. So um, you know, let's see how long it can be sustained. Yeah, that was really going to be my next question. You know, we've we've been talking both in the UK and in Europe on this podcast about about curve steepening. Um, so happy to see that that finally playing out. I, I take from what you just said then that you still think there's further to go in terms of how much the the European curve can steepen from here. Yeah, and that's really the key the, the, the key view for us now. I mean, uh, listeners will know that we've been. Uh, pretty resolutely on the bearish side for rates overall. And I would say that that with low conviction is still in place for most of the same reasons. Um, and actually, on, I think it's important to highlight that whilst there are questions so, so, you know, so swirling around about you know, what the growth momentum looks like elsewhere, actually one of the, the surprises has been that that hasn't materialized as strongly in the data recently um, in, in, in Europe. Um, so there's that, which is um, you know, in the mix, but of course we're coming to the last kind of well five weeks really of quantitative easing, uh, another step down from from next week in uh, in the net purchases, and then presumably it all comes to an end, and we just have reinvestments. And so you know, QE is going to be dropping um, from about you know monthly pace of around 80 billion um, most recently, you know, up until this week, down to about 40. Probably uh, that's our best guess. Anyway, we don't really know exactly what the intensity of the reinvestment purchases will be, but you know, roughly speaking, that's the quantum of the the change, and that's going to all take place over the over the next five weeks or so. Um, you know, that's a pretty big change. Um, you know, we've already said that the supply environment, you know, I mean, you know, is kind of behind for where you would expect it to be this year. So you know, there's going to still be lots of pressure there, and you know, I think that. Uh, yeah, that 
will, you know, combined with maybe a little bit more caution on the central bank side on the rate policy path, um, you know, because of everything else that's been happening. I mean, you know, uh, financial conditions indices, for example, are actually looking you know, historically pretty tight um, in, the, in the in the U.S. context, especially. Um, you know, maybe just one last thing to say: the the financial stability review yesterday um, from from the ECB, you know, didn't have any sort of big flashing red lights about financial fragmentation at the moment. Um, you know, I think that basically means that they're not of the mind to introduce some new policy, you know, some some new kind of tool to try to prevent spreads from from widening if that's sort of where we're where we're headed. Actually spreads took you know seem to have taken that in their stride. Um, but I do think that that points maybe towards uh, again towards a little bit more uh, caution and gradualism on the on, on the rate side. So um, so yeah you know maybe people will think well okay you know, maybe uh, central banks at least in the European context aren't going to try to um, to, to hit the brake too hard and therefore maybe I can uh, feel a little bit sort of you know, more positive about long-term inflation prospects and so on, and maybe you know, um, there's a little bit more scope for this long-end steepening to run. So I'm going to turn it back to you then, um, I suppose. <laughs> um, this week, I guess the big deal in the UK was um, really on the fiscal side. So maybe you can just update us on uh, what the news there was. Yeah, for once less about monetary policy and, and that driving markets, more about fiscal policy this week. So there's a lot of talk, or there has been a lot of talk about potential VAT cuts and, and other measures that, that might be announced to kind of mitigate this cost of living crisis that we're expecting. Um, you know, regular readers of our notes and listeners will know that we think that, that this cost of living crisis is going to be quite severe, particularly in the second half of this year, and, and particularly for those at the bottom half of the income distribution, or at least the bottom third. Uh, and that's been a big driver of our um, more pessimistic economic outlook, I would say, and therefore more dovish Bank of England uh, outlook for, for how they raise rates over the coming months. Um, so some kind of fiscal support, targeted fiscal support have been expected to, to mitigate that. And, and that was what was delivered today. Um, we didn't get um, the VAT cut, but that was in line with our expectations that they were going to deliver that and instead deliver um, a bit more of a targeted fiscal boost. So um, this, you know, the kind of new fiscal measures amount to about 15 billion worth of extra spending. Uh, and that comprises largely of a an increase in the uh, energy rebate um, for all households. But that importantly is no longer a loan. That is a grant. So it won't have to be repaid over the years to come. Uh, it was announced at 200 pounds as a loan back in October. And now that's increased to 400 as a grant. Um, and then some other measures, including kind of benefit, increased benefit payments. Payments, uh, and also uh, more targeted measures towards pensioners and, and help towards their heating bills as well over the winter. So, um, yeah, £15 billion pounds of, of extra stimulus, um, which equates to, and, and around £5 billion of that will be paid for by this kind of windfall tax. So um, an additional fiscal boost this year of, of around £10 billion, pounds we expect. And so that will be funded by 10 billion more gilts. Is that the, the bottom line on the funding yeah, side? I think that's the kind of key takeaway here. You know, we, we've said on this podcast many times that we expect the kind of baseline supply outlook that the OBR, well, the CGNCR numbers imply and the CGNCR numbers published by the OBR were already on the optimistic side, given the kind of optimism we felt that were baked into their forecast back in March. Um, we all had been saying for some weeks now that we saw thought some kind of fiscal boost in the second half or in the rest of this year was coming um, because of this cost of living crisis and also of course we're heading into a kind of pre-election year next year we think so um, we always thought that the risks towards supply were skewed to the upside but I think this um, really just cements that view and and you know the part of the steepening that, that we're seeing in the UK curve today on Thursday is, is as a result of that as well, I think. So the kind of market reaction has been as you would expect for, for that level. Okay. Um, are there any monetary policy implications of, of all of this, do you think? Um, at the margin, yes. I think that 
you know, that 10 billion of, of fiscal boost implies around half a percentage point of onto GDP. So there is, you know, some level of support that, that makes us more optimistic, I suppose, heading into the second half of this year than we were. Um, we were already kind of leaning towards the risk case that two more 25 basis point hikes might be required this year. Our official kind of published forecast was just one more might be required, but uh, behind the scenes, Ross and I have, have been discussing uh, probably shifting that to, to having two more hikes this year. And I think that, you know, this, this fiscal boost just um, adds, you know, conviction to that. So um, uh, in the coming weeks, I'm sure we'll be updating our official call to have two more 25 basis point hikes, um, both in June and August. Um, and then uh, a pause, you know, that that pause that we already had in. Um, and, you know, it's not, not just today's news, I think, that make you slightly more convinced that an additional hike could come. I think Hugh Pill's speech, who we always consider to be, you know, he's the chief economist, we kind of consider him to be a sort of centrist MPC member. He started to sound a little bit more hawkish, we felt, in his speech last Friday. Um, he used the words that... Um, uh, that some way more tightening might be required. And obviously you can interpret that some way in, in different ways, um, especially when taken out of context. But it did feel like he the language he was using implied more than just one additional quarter point rise in bank rate this year. So um, yeah, uh, I think there are monetary policy implications um, that were already kind of arising and, and this just um, cements that view. So for markets, that means that we, um, you know, have added in this additional bank or, or are likely, sorry, we haven't yet, but are likely to add in this additional bank rate hike into our forecast, but still leaves us very much more dovish than market expectations. You know, the market as of today had more than um, uh, five 25 basis point hikes priced in by the end of this year compared to we think maximum two. So although we're shifting our forecast, I guess, in a slightly more hawkish direction, it still puts us um, very much at the dovish end of of uh, market expectations. Um, and so I guess going back to what you were saying earlier, Giles, with regards to the steepness of the curve, you know, it doesn't change that being one of our core views and, and pretty much everything you said about Europe can kind of be translated also into the UK and that we have this kind of mildly bearish view, but we have much more conviction now uh, in the curve shape than the outright direction of travel of yields. And, and we've been holding those steepness in the UK in twos tens. Um, and I don't think this kind of changes that. If anything, the, the fiscal support adds impetus to that steepness whilst adding in an additional bank rate um, in our forecast at the front end still leaves us more dovish than the market. So we still think that there's tightening to be priced out there. With that then, since we're talking about central banks, um, let's quickly move on to uh, the US where we had um, the FOMC minutes. Um, did we learn anything new from those, Jan? Uh, they were supposed to be this week's kind of key event, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, actually, they turned out to be, uh, you know, kind of benign, not, didn't induce any market volatility. And mostly, not that we didn't learn anything uh, on its own, it would, be, it would have been a very informative document, except since the FOMC and until the release of the meetings, uh, there has been a ton of uh, Fed officials coming out, including the chair, basically telling us what to expect, which is uh, unless something dramatically changes in the economy, the path of inflation or growth, we're going to hike by 50 basis points at the next two meetings and then re uh, potentially revert back to 25 in September. Q, uh, QT was already announced, so there's nothing new in there. The previous minutes contained the details around QT, which made them a little bit more interesting. But given the, the difference, the time period between the actual meeting, the press conferences in between, and the release of the minutes, and by now it feels like an outdated, uh, outdated document. But what I would point out uh, with respect to uh, the tone of the minutes was that it felt pretty optimistic. It felt kind of upbeat on the consumer, particularly on the strong consumer balance sheets that were built up during the pandemic. Seems like a, you know, like a, a common talking point uh, within the Fed as well. They're relying a lot on that to be able to absorb any kind of cost shocks that come into the economy. On the other hand, uh, the acceptance that there is a massive uncertainty around inflation and potentially risks to the upside uh, have been well acknowledged and are now 
not really, you know, completely the days of yesteryear where transitory inflation are abandoned. And now there's a, you know, wide acknowledgement that risks are still pointing to the upside. Although there were some couple of regional Fed uh, presidents discussing that their local business contacts are now uh, seeing easing up of the supply chains, but overall the environment for uh, from a cost side still remains pretty tight. And and one final thing, they there is a kind of this lingering question of whether they're going to sell uh, mortgage-backed securities. We don't think that would happen at least until something like middle of next year. At some point, we do believe it will indeed. Uh, have to, you know, they'll have to start doing that just because they otherwise the composition of the balance sheet wouldn't be made up mostly of treasury securities uh, as they want it to be. So uh, what, it, what that means is they're going, they're likely to do that. It feels like for now it's a distant thought for a lot of the officials, but there is discussion on that. And the minutes also had a little bit of a discussion. They're worried about the potential kind of like the financial systemic risks that might come from the from QT in general, which includes uh, potential uh, MBS sales in the future. But for now, I would uh, I would caution against taking that you know into immediate planning because they have to give them well in advance uh, you know forewarning that it's happening. And I would imagine they prepare us for at least six months earlier before they actually start with that process. Overall, a pretty balanced document. We knew what to expect, and uh, even though it was kind of like the data highlight of the week, we didn't end up learning all that much. I've been asking Jan a lot about uh, the Fed's QT this week, so I feel like that last comment may have been directly for my benefit. <laughs> but thank you, Jan, for putting it on record. Uh, more broadly, then, Giles kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the call, but you know we've had a, a, a much more kind of risk stable environment this week, and, and Treasuries have rallied um, a fair amount. Uh, you have, you know, readers and listeners will know that you went long Treasuries. Um, well, probably a month ago now, I would say. So how do you feel the outlook is from here and, and have you changed that kind of bullish view? Yeah, it feels like forever now, but I think it's actually becoming exactly exactly like a, uh, about a month now. Because, and just to uh, backstep a little bit, the transition of our view was in early April, or really post the March FOMC, we start, start uh, moved into a more neutral view. And after that, increasingly, uh, we started kind of taking the side that the FOMC is probably plateauing in how much tightness they want to communicate to the markets, which kind of, which culminated after the, after the May meeting, we suggested sort of entering into a long the full conviction. And it pretty much has worked out pretty well. Our average entry is about uh, at 3%. So now their 10 year yield is closer to 2.7. Initial target we had in mind was going retracing back to two and a half percent, and the reason behind that is the FOMC has delivered what we think they should in order to induce these tight financial conditions as they operate through the forward channels. If they stick to what they've already committed to or signal, uh, the tightening has already begun. So they just have to maintain course, perhaps even uh, stop short if inflation slows down or you, you see like a material deterioration in growth. And the latter is why we assumed uh, investors will be shifting their focus from inflation back into the growth side of the equation, because Fed has communicated how much they want to tighten. It looks like it's, it's an adequate level. They don't want to up the ante to a point where it starts becoming counterproductive and people immediately price in an imminent recession, which pretty much it works against them, takes out a, a longer term yields will fall a lot and loosen up financial conditions. So with that, uh, in our mind, we see a scenario where the Fed wants to balance uh, uh, you know, between controlling inflation and not uh, you know, scaring, freaking out people. And, but, but nevertheless, investors in our mind are going to continue to focus more and more on growth, which is I think what has been happening. You, know, you see how these uh, Fed officials speaking have very marginal contribution to the price action. But on the other hand, something like new home sales, which came well below uh, expectations, uh, led to almost a 10 basis point rally. Uh, you have equity earnings, which you know retailers coming kind of weak that uh, were kind of driving a broad risk off uh, that also spooked treasury markets and led to, you know, like the usual uh, bond buying in the back of equity weakness, which we haven't seen in a long time as Jala has recently pointed out too. It seems to be coming back a little bit in treasuries given 
how much yields are backed out. So, so we think now we are more likely to be in a range bound area between two and a half and 3%. We maintain our bullish bias, but the majority of that trade is probably behind us now. We still think you could, we could see a drift towards 250, but uh, until we see data remaining robust uh, in, in the next you know, couple of months, I don't think there's a very obvious catalyst that could push uh, the next leg higher in yields. And meanwhile, I think foreign investors are probably going to be a little bit more enticed, uh, you know, now that they, they don't have to kind of catch this proverbial falling knife, uh, yield to stabilize a little bit. So uh, I think the move is towards uh, drifting slightly lower, maybe consolidating around here. And we'll be looking forward to things like Jackson Hole, where we could get kind of like the outlook for what to expect from the FOMC uh, in September and beyond. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that echoes kind of what Giles was saying, not on this podcast, but, you know, just on the desk at the beginning of the week, that it feels much more like the markets are going to be driven by the data and, and by equities at the moment than it is by central bank. You know, they, they've kind of set their stall now and, and now it's about the data to kind of confirm to that story that they've laid out or, or otherwise. All right, guys, thank you for joining me today. And thank you to our listeners for listening in um just a reminder that next week uh we got a double bank holiday in the uk very exciting uh so uh we won't be recording boncast next week but we will be back as usual uh the week after when we'll have nearly two weeks of things to talk about uh, so i'm sure that will be a good one uh thanks everyone have a good week